Everybody's bored, ain't got nothing to do. 30 seconds. Hello, uh, give us a few minutes. We're going to let some other people join in and we'll get started. Let's see if I can get my wife's computer set up to where we can see everybody's comments. And if you're wanting to take the Native American lore or Indian lore honor, they're the same thing that it was changed to Native American lore a few years back. So if you want to, put in on the comments who you are and where you're from, and we can see who all's watching. Hello, I see we've got one on watching us. Like I say, we'll give it just a few more minutes before you start. A um, little bit of background about me and my wife. Uh, my wife was the leader of a local club here for, I think it was 12 to 13 years, and I was her assistant. Uh, we're no longer part of a club, but we love Pathfinders, so we travel around and teach honors and help out where people want us to. So if anybody's interested in us coming, once all this coronavirus stuff's over and help out teaching honors and stuff, just let us know. We love to come do lock-ins and things like that. Uh, matter of fact, we're in the process right now. We live on an island in southeast Georgia, right on the river, and we're actually putting a learning center in the room and upstairs of our house. So we'll have a lot of our artifacts and different things like that on display for people to see. It looks like we've got more and more people coming in. Looks like some from North Carolina and other areas around. Washington. Uh, one other thing, I'm hoping that this video will be able to be saved on Facebook so that if somebody wants to come back and watch it later, if they miss it, they should have the opportunity to do it. I've got a website and if I can get it to record like it should and figure out how to do it, I'm gonna to try to take and publish it maybe on uh, YouTube or something like that so you can watch it at a later date. Uh, can everybody hear my audio and everything all right? Does it sound well with how I'm doing everything? So if not, I can try to turn it up or do something different. Okay, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I like to start an honor with a prayer if we can. So that the Lord will bless us and help us to learn something. So let's all bow our heads. Father, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for the beautiful weather that we have. At least it's beautiful where I am. I hope it is where everybody else is. Thank you for allowing us to be able to have the technology to where even though times are crazy right now, that we can still come together and we can still learn about you and worship you. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us and please help everybody's health. And thank you for giving us all you do. And please help us to learn a little bit more about you and the blessings you've given us. Guide us and be with us, Father, in your name, amen. Uh, once again, my name is Matt Ellis. My wife is sitting here beside me, but she doesn't want to be on camera. Her name is Amy, 
and she's going to be watching your comments and if you have questions or something let me know and we'll try to answer them this is the first time i've ever done this and i will warn you my internet is terrible out here so i'm trying to use my phone just be praying that everything will work out well um, i'm using some programs and stuff that we've not ever used before so hopefully the lord will bless us and everything will work out right uh, if you're part of the florida conference I don't know how they done it, whether they sent out an email with packets of information or whatever, but everybody should have an Indian lore worksheet or Native American lore. This one is still called Indian lore, but as I said, Native American lore is the newer name that they've given to it. Uh, if you don't have this, you can actually, I believe there's a site you can download it from the NAD. So that's something that you can do uh, for directors. They should have given you an answer sheet also, and that's something else that you can find online also. And then there is also a test to be given afterwards. This is something with is not usually done when we do honors in person, but the conference wanted a way to test the Pathfinders afterwards to make sure that they had got something from it. It's just 10 questions, it's nothing real hard. So the Pathfinders should have a test and the directors should have the answer key for that. If you're not part of the Florida Conference and you would like some of this material, if you're having trouble finding it or something, you're welcome to contact me through Facebook and I'll do my best to, to get it emailed to you. I try to keep copies of all the honors we teach, the workout, the worksheets and everything else. And that way we have all the information we need to give you. Um, if somebody has missed this honor now, we even though it should be recorded on Facebook, we're also going to be teaching again later in the day. Um, after this honor, we will be doing dinosaurs. So I think we've got like a 30 minute interval in between those. So if you want to come back and do dinosaurs with us, you're welcome to come do that. But we will go ahead and get started. Uh, this is a uh, honor that is pretty old. Um, and I believe from reading it, it was probably, uh, if I had to guess, I would guess it was created more in the Northwest because it talks more about the, the Native Americans in that area. And I'm not as familiar with the Native Americans over there. Since I'm from the Southeast U.S., that's more what I'm familiar with. But, I mean, they still did a lot of the same things. So we'll talk about some of that. Like I say, if y'all have some questions or have some input, we'll try to do it through comments. And hopefully everything will work all right, and we'll do it. Now, I'm going to see if I can get my slides on the PowerPoint to start working. And so it's named, the first question on your worksheet is name five uses made of natural materials by the Northwest Indians. So let's talk about some things. One of the first things they used was called vermilion. It was a red, red pigment that probably came from some of the the soils or something in the areas. It was a type of a natural element, I guess you would call it. And they could use this as a dye. You know, it was a pigment they could use for all kinds of different things. Whenever you see where they make clay pots, you'll see different dyes on the pots and things like that. And I know the Indians in this area could use some of the clays and get some of the different dyes out of it. So I'm guessing that's what they use the vermilion for. I know they've done some things and they claim that in the area of Georgia, north of where I'm at, like in North Georgia, that some of the pigments used for nose clays were actually taken down to South America. I think that maybe some of the Aztec or Incan people used it on some of the buildings down there and things like that. So they had a pretty good network of getting these different materials to use for pigments and different things like that. And the vermilion was one similar to that. Another material that they used was cedar. Most everybody probably knows what cedar is. We use it today for woods for building houses. They use it a lot of times to put inside closets because cedar puts off, uh, I would say a smell, but it's got toxins and things like that in it. They aren't really necessarily toxic to us, but it does help keep moths and stuff out of your closet. And today our houses seal so well, we don't have much trouble with that. But people used to, 100 years ago, they would line their closet with cedar, and that would help keep the bugs out. Well, it will also keep a lot of your bugs that would eat 
the seed or, or you know wood that you would use for building houses and things like that because Indians not all of them lived in teepees a lot of them actually built houses and the ones in the northwest did also they would have lodge houses and different things like that so when they use a cedar the cedar would not get the different bugs in it as bad to eat it and it would also not get the bacteria and stuff in it that would rot it so cedar was a very good material used for that some of the items they used it to make where they used it for building what they called long houses so they were large houses they used i've got some pictures later that we'll see and let's see let me switch my powerpoint where you can see a cedar tree but uh they would also there was a red and a yellow cedar and they would make the totem poles that you see out of that they also would make ceremonial masks they would make rattles they would make food containers out of some parts of it. Uh, some boxes they would make for storage, spoons, spindles, even some parts of it they could use for making hats and capes and different things like that. It's amazing what the Native Americans would use some of the natural fibers and stuff like that for that we would never think to use for different things. So cedar was one of the materials that they used. So that's two of them. So let's move on to another one. There's a picture of one of the cedar longhouses. So you don't think about Native Americans building things like that, but they did make them. If I'm not mistaken, the Cherokee also made some different things like that. Okay, so another material they used was rush. And this is a basket made out of rush. Rush is kind of a type of grass that's more from the Northwest area. I don't know that we have it in the southeast here where we are, but we have other materials. They would use the palm fronds from the palm tree or the palmetta, and they would make baskets and things out of that. And they would make some baskets out of even pine needles. And I have pine needle baskets and stuff I could show you if we were in person. But they used rush to build baskets for things like this. They would make mats. You know, they had floor mats and things, just like we have in our houses. They would make skirts out of them. They would make hats. They could use them to make rattles. They would make, like I said, baskets. They could even make temporary dwellings and things like that from rush. So it was a very readily available item they had because, it, like I say, it was a type of a grass. So it was something that they could get very easily. But it was something that took some work to, to plait all these together or braid them together to make the materials that they were using. But it's something that they could use. It's a renewable resource that was always there. And it, as you can see, it made a very nice basket out of it. it. Worked very well for the things they were doing. Okay, another item that they would use that probably a lot of people wouldn't think about. They would use... You would think about sheep, you know, that they would use hair from the sheep, but they would also use it from dogs also. You know, you have a lot of long-haired dogs that they could take the hair and probably shear them about like they would with the sheep and use them for stuff. So hair from woolly dog breeds and the sheep, so they would use them for a lot of different purposes. Sometimes they would combine them with a cedar bark. Now, when you think about cedar bark, don't think of a bark like it's on an oak tree or even a pine tree like we have in the southeast. Cedar bark almost has some fuzzy type stuff built into it. And that can kind of be separated out and it can be mixed in with the hair from the sheep or the dog and you can spin it into a yarn. And then, you know, naturally they would use the yarn to make about anything we would as far as knitting and stuff like that. So that they would take the yarn and they would weave it into black baskets. And then they would also use the down feathers from ducks and geese. And I know a lot of uh, the younger generation, especially, may not know what down is. If you've ever saw where they talk about a down comforter and what a down feather is off of a goose or a duck, is they're the real fine feathers like you see on the duck's chest or a goose's chest. And they're very good for insulating. It helps to make them waterproof. So they pluck those feathers out of a duck or a goose and they put them inside of the blankets like that because it makes it very soft and fluffy, but it also helps hold in the heat and it helps the blanket actually work better. So if you ever see a down comforter, unless they're started making some kind of synthetic thing nowadays, that should mean that it's made out of feathers of a duck or a goose. 
Any questions so far, Amy? I see her over there intently reading, so just want to make sure that we're not missing anything. Okay. Something else was buffalo. They used a lot of products from animals. Um, and you think about a buffalo. A lot of people don't like to think about them hunting and stuff, but, you know, that is where they got a lot of their things from because they would kill an animal like this for food, but they didn't waste anything on that animal. I know some of the older generation from here said, you know, back in the Depression eras, whenever they butchered a hog, they used everything on him but a squeal. And that was about true. And the Native Americans did about the same thing on the buffaloes and the animals they killed. You know, they would take uh, the clothes, they would make clothing from the hair and stuff and even the hides. They would make bags, they would make pouches, they would make backrest, they would do pictographs, and they could make drums from the leathers that they used from him. You could make rattles and moccasins, they would make robes out of the buffalo, they would do padding out of the hides. They could take some of him and, and turn it into a glue. They could make needle and thread. Um, if you know what sinhu is, it's kind of like muscles of different parts. It's not muscles, but it's different parts in his, the connect, connecting tissue uh, where his muscles work and stuff. And they could take that and make threads out of it. Uh, some parts of him, I know on different animals and probably him also, they could take and make their bow strings and stuff like that out of it. Uh, said they would make cooking pots from the stomach. They would make rattles from the hooves. Even the brains, they didn't eat the brains as far as I know, but there's a chemical inside the brain they can use for tanning the, the hides, which makes a real good quality leather. So one thing that you, the more you study about the Native Americans, you learn is even though they hunted and stuff like that, they used every part they could off of that animal and they wasted hardly anything. They were very good stewards of nature. And I think there's lessons we could probably learn from them about a lot of that stuff today. Um, very interesting, the things they done. And a matter of fact, some of the things that they did with the medicines and stuff, a lot of doctors and stuff are starting to go back and try to relearn some of this stuff because we're finding out that the, the way we make medicines and stuff today has a lot more side effects and doesn't necessarily work as well as what the herbs and the things like that that were natural that they used back then. Okay, something else that they used. The yucca plant, or I believe I've been corrected by some of the Spanish, I believe they call it yucca. But uh, this is a plant that you can do a lot with. I'm not familiar with the variety from out in the, the Southwest. They use it a lot. It's a little bit different, I believe, than what we have here because I know the ones out there, you can actually eat some of the parts and stuff and you can find different parts of them that they've imported in over here that are in the grocery stores and stuff. So if you like to eat that, they do have it in this area. They said there's fruit from it. I think they eat some of the roots off of it and things like that. Um, I didn't think about it. I've got some out front. I could have went and cut a couple of the leaves off of them. The leaves are very, very tough. I usually like to take 10 or 12 whenever we go around to a club and let the pathfinders, each one of them, grab an end and try to break it. These are very, very tough. And you can take them and you can plait them together, kind of like braiding them, and you can use them to make hats and mats and all kind of things like that. They're very tough for that. Or there's a certain way you can kind of take a, a couple of sticks or rocks and kind of beat them together. And they have like fibrous strings inside of them. And if you know how to do it, you can take that and make cordage, they call it, or make like ropes and strings and things like that out of it. So it's got a lot of real good uses. Like I say, it's a very strong plant. And it's something that, once again, is natural and it's there. So it's not something that takes a whole lot of effort to turn it into what you want it to. There is some work to it, but like I say, it's something you can do. And back then they didn't have TVs or nothing. So, you know, you sat there and did stuff like that when you were sitting around in a group talking to everybody. You know, it was something that, that kind of helped to make things well. Uh, looks like maybe some of this may be stopping from time to time. I'm hoping it's, it's going to go all right. We're going to keep trying. Okay, we'll go over a few other things. I think y'all probably already got five. 
but well it's this that's the fifth one but it's also going into a few other things about the yucca plant uh, we talked about the cordage they could also take the fibers of it and they would make paint brushes out of it it said that they would take like the leaves and they would chew on them and chew the edge until it was real real fine and they could use it to paint different things on and decorate their pottery and stuff uh, they said the roots, there was also kind of a product in it that whenever you pounded the roots and whipped it in cold water, it made suds like a soap and you could use it for shampoo for your hair. So you wonder where they may have got some of the products we get from the grocery store today. Well, they had to figure it out and make it for themselves. But the Lord provided and everything is out there that they were able to use. They also, like I said earlier, they would use it for basket, basketry. They would wave, wave weave them together and make baskets and things like that out of them. Very, very handy plant to have around. A lot of things you could do with it. Okay, so that really covers one and two because that's name, name five uses made of natural materials and name five uses made of the yucca plant. So we talked about the different uses they made of the yucca plant. It was one of the materials. But you had food, cordage, paintbrush, shampoo, and basketry. So that's five things that was used for the yucca. Okay, we go on down to number three. And it says to name five uses made of the birch tree by the Eastern Woodland Indians. So now we're getting more in the area of where I'm at. But where I'm at right now, if I'm far enough south, we don't really have birch trees. Get a little bit further north, you start to find them. I've got some birch materials, but I didn't get some of that out because with the picture of me, it's so small and you just really can't see how the stuff's made. But uh, this is a, a birch tree. I've just now put it up on the screen. Sometimes there may be a little delay. You can see the way the bark is. The bark on it is kind of a thin paper-like deal. And I think I've got another picture. You can see here, one of the uses is they could actually take and peel that bark off and make a bowl out of it. So they could use it for a lot of things that, you know, we might would use uh, cardboard for maybe, or even like a real thin plywood maybe like we would use it for. Um, a lot They call one of the varieties, is called a paper birch. And they would actually take the paper birch and use it for the outer covering for canoes. They could make it waterproof and it was tough. You know, you could use an animal hide, but the thing you would run into with the animal hide was it would absorb the water to where the birch would not like the hides would. And plus the animal hide also, if it gets too wet, it'll stretch and it gets heavier and softer. So they would use it for the outer, co outer covering of canoes. They said they would also make the bowls for it, like what we're looking at on the screen. Uh, it has a resinous oil in it also, and it peels into paper-thin strips. And it said that would also ignite real easily at the slightest part, a spark. So it was very good for using as tinder and helping to start fires. So that's another use they would use for it was as tinder. That's T-I-N-D-E-R. The wood of the birch also contains an oil that burns even wet. So they can use it as a fire starter, but you know, if they're out there and they've just had a big rain, all your wood's gonna be wet. But this wood, similar to what our pine wood over here, even if it's wet, once you get your fire just a little bit warm, the resins inside the, uh, the wood would actually catch on fire and burn very well, just like the pine sap does over here. So it's it's a firewood that can be used even in wet weather. So it worked well for that. So it was also used for making torches because so a lot of times they would do night fishing and they could use it for torches for that. So several of the things it was used for, they used it for canoes, they used it for bowls, they used it for tinder, they used it as firewood, and they used it for torches. Okay, some other things that they would use the bark for. And I know we're going beyond the five, but we may as well learn some more things. We don't always have to do with just what's on the worksheet. They said the bark could be used for brewing a wintergreen tea. They said it was very high in vitamin C. 
And for those of us here in the southeast where we're at, we all know what a pine tree is. You can actually brew pine needles and get vitamin C out of that. You can make a pine needle tea. Now, one thing when you're doing stuff like that with trees and stuff, don't just go out there and throw stuff in boiled water and think you're making a tea out of it. If you're going to start trying to eat a lot of this stuff, make sure you know how to do it right because some of this stuff does contain some stuff that could be poisonous. So you want to make sure you're doing it the right way. But they did, and they knew how to make it. And like I say, it was a very good source for vitamin C. Uh, so they also made fans out of it. And they were used both for creating a cool breeze, which we all know how nice that can be. But they would also use it to fan the fire back and forth whenever they were trying to start it. Because something like that works a lot better than sitting there trying to blow on it. So they used it for fanning a fire. They said they could also use it whenever they were going out in battle. They would make arm guards. And they could also use it to make quivers to hold the arrows for their bows. So it was something that they used for armament, you know, and things like that. Uh, they also made rattles out of it. And they also used it to wrap their food in sometimes if they needed to. It didn't have Tupperware or Ziploc bags back then, so you had to use what was available. So that's just some of the uses just for birch bark, you know, or a birch tree. So they really learned to live off the land and learned to use what was available to them. Okay, now this is usually when we start getting hungry. We'll move on to four. It says, no, 15 plant foods introduced to us by the Indians include four plants names used today and there are probably a lot of them on here that you probably do not realize come from this country so we'll start and we'll name some of them and let's see if i can change slides here's one of them avocado that's something that come from the americas you had agave you have papaya squash and let's see go through some more of these slides you had beans blueberries cacao beans corn one of my favorites i love to have a ear of corn for breakfast in the morning it's really good guava peanuts i just actually sat down and had some of those a few minutes ago that were nice and green pecans and now there's there's two ways to pronounce this there's pecans and pecans and i've always pronounced it pecan because i'm from the south and everybody's always told me that's wrong well I did a little bit of research pecan is the original name and it's an indian name it is pronounced different than how we say things today. So if you say pecan, that is the original and the correct way to say it. it. May not be correct grammar for how we teach today, but it is not an original English word. So that's how it's pronounced. Okay, a little bit of uh, English or grammar or whatever you want to call it. All right, the pine nuts. I don't know how many of y'all have ever tried the pine nuts, but if you look, you'll see when the uh, the pine cone opens up and you have the gaps in between the little leaflet things you see there, the pine nuts will come out with that. And they've got like a little, it's not a membrane, but it's a real thin piece that's on them. And if you've ever been around a pine tree, whenever they open up like this, you'll see them kind of coming down and spinning like little helicopters from the top of the tree and they hit the ground. And there's a little seed on there and that's basically a pine seed. Uh, people don't eat them from these as much. I'll eat them every now and then. I kind of like them. But a lot of the pines out in the west, I think maybe in northern California, the pine nuts are a lot bigger on those trees out there. So a lot of people put them in salads and things like that. And I mean, they've got a different flavor to them. Um, here, whenever the pine cones begin to open, the squirrels and stuff like that eat a lot of them. So next time you see a pine on the ground, and it hadn't been there too long, 
if you'll pick it up, a lot of times if you'll pull those little petals down or whatever they're actually called, you'll see a couple of seeds still left in there and you'll see what a pine nut is. Okay, we'll move on. Pineapple. You always think of Hawaii whenever you think of pineapples, but from what I understand, I think they originated down in the South America area. And there's several different varieties of pineapples. The normal one you get, you know, kind of burns your mouth, the real acidy like. There's one, my sister lives in Hawaii, and she says there's one called a sugar loaf that's more of a whiter, and said it doesn't have the acid in it to burn your mouth. So a lot of different varieties, very good for you. Uh, a lot of different things that it helps treat in your body. So something good for us to eat. Prickly pear. Never tried this. I know a lot of people have, and they say they're real good. I know that uh, Gucci Pines, they treat a lot of their diabetics with aloe, but they had one a while back come in that could not be treated with it, and they took a cactus similar to a prickly pear and treated them with that, and it helped their diabetes out to get their sugar, sugar, excuse me, sugar under control. So there's a lot of good things, you know, that come with the prickly pears and the different things like that. The different natural foods God gave us really are healing and do a lot of things for us that are good. Pumpkins, that's another thing that's come from this area. And like I say, there's just so much that we have in our diet we don't even realize originally come from here. Butternut squash. Strawberries. I love strawberries. They're fresh. We have local people here that actually grow them. They're very good. Sunflowers. Love sunflower seeds. Tomatoes. I like tomatoes and some stuff. You know, it's, it's good that the Lord made a variety of stuff because all of us like different things to eat and there's something for everybody. Vanilla. Vanilla is more of like an orchid. And that's where vanilla, that's the vanilla flower. It's called a vanilla bean is where they actually get the extracts and stuff from. But that's what vanilla is. Wintergreen. Uh, wintergreen's an herb. Smells very good whenever you crunch the leaves up and stuff. Okay, wild rice is something that came from this country. We've probably already passed 15. Let me go back. Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and stop there. I've got a lot more I could read you. Bell pepper and stuff like that. You know, cashews, cassava, cranberries, green beans, hazelnuts, hickory nuts. Um, just so much stuff that come from over here. Sweet potatoes. I think regular potatoes come from over here. Uh, just so much stuff and a lot of good stuff that's good for you. Okay, we're going to talk about something a little different. Some people get a little bit of a like the picture here a lot. <laughs> but uh, it says describe Indian stalking and tracking. Well, you know, on a lot of the old movies, you always see them put their ear to the ground like this and they would listen. And for some things, you know, I guess that would work. You know, if you were halfway close to it, you don't have all the noise we have from trains and cars and stuff here now. So if you were out, you know, in the Midwest and stuff where you had herds of buffaloes, you could probably hear or feel a little bit of something if you were sensitive enough. Um, I know they said that back whenever white man first went over in those areas where the buffalo were, that sometimes it would take a couple of days for the herds to cross. They were so large. And that to me would be really something to see. But when it comes to stalking and stuff like that, the Native Americans had a lot of techniques. Uh, you know, for instance, I just put a slide up here of different tracks. Well, you know, if you're hunting something for food, you want to know what the footprint looks like. Because if you wanted a rabbit to eat, You'd be real upset if you tracked something for a half mile that you thought was rabbit tracks and found out that it was a skunk. Because I doubt the meat's probably as good on the skunk as it is on the rabbit. So, you know, that's just one of the things that you want to look at. You know, you don't want to come up on something that you thought may have been a raccoon or something and, and stalk him and corner him and find out you had a bobcat. Because chances are, if you're not faster than he is, you might get the bad side of him. So, you know, they knew what the tracks were. They could look at the size of the tracks. They could tell you about how large the animal was. 
they had a way of looking at the tracks and probably telling you about how long they've been there. You know, you can look at it. Just if it's a dry time and you're in sandy soil, you can see how much the track's degraded by maybe wind blowing a little sand in it and stuff like that. If you're in a wet area, you can look at the track. And a lot of times, if it's a bigger animal, especially when they step in that track because the, the dirt stuff's so wet around it and he's pressed it down on the ground, the water will soak out of the ground and fill the track up with water. So if you know that's how it is and you know about how long that takes, and they probably did because this was stuff they done every day, they could get a sense of how long it had been since that animal crossed. And if you look at it and you figure it's been a couple of days, it's probably no need in following that track because that animal's probably already gone. And he's a lot further down the road than what you're going to be able to catch up with him. But if you look at the track and it's real dry, and you can see the water starting to come in there that you know it's not been too long since he come through here. So you can go ahead and try to, to catch up with him and you might can catch him. Um, <clears throat> now once he called up to that animal, then he started doing stalking. And that's whenever you start being very, very quiet. <clears throat> you find things to hide up and slip up to him. You wanted to look at the wind direction because you didn't want the wind to your back <clears throat> to where it was blowing toward him that allowed him to smell you better. And there's just all kind of different things you could do. You know, you might want to get the, the sun to your back so it kind of blinds him a little bit. Animals are very sensitive to a lot of things. They can hear, smell real good, most of them. And they'll usually know you're there if you're not careful. I know we live out in the middle of the woods and you can sneak up on them sometimes, but the ones out here aren't real skittish. But it's just, it's real interesting sometimes to try to sneak up on an animal. And you can tell that he knows you're there. And he's just trying to figure out whether you're something that's going to bother him or not. So that's some of the different things they've done. I uh, don't really have a lot more slides about that. But a lot of ways you can do that. Um, if you get time to do the animal tracking on her sometime, You'll see what I'm talking about on some of the different tracks. That's a good honor to take, and it'd be a good one to combine with this sometimes if somebody wanted to do a weekend or something. You know, try to go out and find some tracks and try to maybe even sneak up on some animals and things like that. Uh, I know we've done animal tracking out here where we live. You take the cast of the different footprints and stuff. Or if we just take a hike out here, it's neat to see the different tracks and let the kids try to guess what they are. Because out here, we're on a real sandy road. It's like a powdery sand. And when it's real dry, you can actually see the tracks of the insects where they've crossed the road and stuff. And it's fun to try to figure out what they are. So something whenever you think about it and you go back out in the woods again, see if you can figure out what's walked out there in front of you. It's, it's kind of neat to try to do that. Okay. I think we've probably talked about that enough because... Probably nobody's going to actually gonna be going out hunting for their food like the Indians did. But uh, it's something that if you wanted to, to get more involved with it, there's a lot you can learn. Okay, so that brings us to number six. Name five rocks and or minerals and uses made them by Indians. Okay, so the first slide that I've got up here is flint. Flint is a rock or mineral, whatever you want to call it. It's more of a rock. But flint is something that they could use for all kinds of different things. Uh, it's a real hard, and I guess you would call it a brittle rock. But being like that, that also makes it where whenever it flakes off or breaks, it leaves very, very sharp edges. Uh, I know there's another rock similar to it, and let's see... I may have it on some of these other slides, but it's called obsidian. It's similar to flint, but it's almost more of like a volcanic glass. And I think they said that, uh, I don't remember whether it was the Incas or the Aztecs, but they actually made scalpels out of those and used them to do some surgeries. And they said they would actually get sharper than the scalpels our doctors use today. So, you know, the flint will do about the same way. It'll get very sharp. They used it for arrowheads. They could use it to make knife blades. Uh, 
they actually have got some and that's I love it whenever people are here. I've got some scrapes they made that you can actually, they were made, they're authentic. They were made by Indians. Your fingers fit in them perfect. And whenever they would skin an animal and they needed to scrape all the, the hide, you know, all the blood vessels and all that stuff off the hides, they could scrape every bit of it off with that. So they used it for a lot of different tools and stuff because it was something that was very durable, lasted a long time, and it was very sharp. And even like the airheads, if they had a big one, if they broke the tip off, they could re-nap it or reshape it and make a little bit smaller one <clears throat> for a different function. But they could still continue to use it. It's just it's a very good material for what they used it for. So let's see. Argulite. <clears throat> this is another type of material that they used. They used it mainly in art. Uh, it was a... a Material, I think it was softer, maybe similar to like soapstone or something like that. So it was easy for them to shape. So you can see here, if I'm not mistaken, the picture I've got up here is of a piece pipe. So they would be, you know, able to make a little bowl in it, you know, down in top, the top of where the face is on it. But because it was softer material, they could take, you know, bones or even some, they would make drill bits out of the flint and they could drill a shaft through it you know, hole for the smoke to go in if they wanted to use it for a pipe or something like that. But they could even take flint or harder rock and use it to carve, you know, the different things you're seeing in this picture here. So, like I say, it was mainly used in art. Okay. Clay. Clay, you wouldn't think of as a rock. It's more of a mineral. But, you know, everybody saw clay pottery, and we even see the clay that people use to make things out of today. So, you know, it was making for pottery and effigies, and I think effigy is more what you would call like a little statue or something like that is what you would call that, for, you know. So clay had its uses for things like that. Gold. I mean, everybody knows what we use gold for today. And that was a lot of what they used it for back then. You know, gold... We have a lot of uses for gold and electronics and things like that today. That was things that they did not have back then. Uh, if you wanted to make a knife out of gold, didn't work worth a flip. Gold's a very soft metal. If you've ever felt lead or something like that, it's heavy, but it's soft. It won't really hold an edge or anything. But one thing nice about gold is, you know, where steel rust and eventually goes away, gold does not. You know, so gold is a material that will stay there for a long time. It's, it's something that's easy to work with so they can make jewelry and all kind of things like that. So, you know, gold was more of a use for jewelry and art and things like that. It's not necessarily a metal that they would use for stuff. Melts at a low temperature and things like that. So it's something that they could deal with and use a lot more readily than the stuff we use today. Okay, I talked about the obsidian. This is a picture of obsidian. Most people, like I say, believe that it was probably made from volcanic action. It would melt sands and things like that. And it just makes a rock like that. But it's it's almost like glass. And like I say, you can break shards of it off. And you know how sharp glass gets when it breaks. And this is the same way. It's probably a little stronger than glass with the way it's made. But just it's really a good material for some things. It's really a little bit too brittle for airheads and stuff. They did use it for airheads and knife blades, but if you were not careful, if you hit something too hard, it would go ahead and break it to where flint has a little bit more structural integrity and a hold up better. You know, you really wouldn't want to use it for a knife blade if you were going to be doing anything real heavy. I guess if you were maybe doing some real fine cutting, it might would work, but if you were going to try to do any hacking or anything like that, it probably would go ahead and break the blade off. Okay, let's see if I can move on to the next one. Sandstone. Sandstone was something they used for a lot of things. Um, I've got, th this is like a grinding stone or something like that. I've got several of these that I like to bring around. And you, the ones I have, we usually put some hard dried corn on it and let the pathfinders take and grind it. And they can grind their own cornmeal out of it. So that's what they used a lot of this stuff for. The sandstone was a softer material. So you could carve it with a harder rock or something. 
So they used it for functioning things, for food processing and stuff like that. They would also use it for art and things like that because, like I say, it could be easily carved. And they can just a lot of different things they could do with it. Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Soapstone. Soapstone was used for carving because it's very soft, similar like the argillite we were talking about earlier. So they could carve it into different things. They actually made bowls out of them. Uh, they could make slabs, like we would use pans, but they would make slabs for cooking things on. Because, I mean, it's, it's stone. If you put it in the fire, it's not like it's going to burn up. So you can put it in the fire and use it like we could a skillet or something like that. You could cook on top of it. And it was easily carved so they could get it in the shape or get a good flat surface. So, you know, it was made good for, for using for cooking utensils. And like I say, you see there's a little carved bear. They would just use it for all kind of things like that. Um, I say it's not real hard. So it's not something you necessarily want to use for an arrowhead or something probably for trying to make an axe head out of like they would do with some of the stones and stuff like that. But like I say, for what they used it for, it worked great. They had a whole variety of different things like that that they could use them for. Okay, that should have given you over five items, I'm sure, uh, that we talked about. So we'll move on to the next one. So it's explained one way airheads were made by the Indians. I've got a couple of slides here. This is something I've never done before, but I would like to learn how to do it sometime. Uh, and this is more of obsidian and not flint he's doing right here, I believe, because you can see it's a little shinier, although some flint looks a little like that. But you see he's got what looks like the tip of an antler off of a deer. And let me see if I can move on to another slide, because some of them show them a little bit better. You can see some more arrowheads here. Uh, my next one will show even a little better, but you can see on some of these, I'll put my cursor up here. Maybe you can follow along with me. Maybe I don't have too much of a lag, but you can see, you know, they just basically take a big chunk of the stuff and they'd get a harder rock and just start breaking it. And they would try to break it into a shape and then slowly just chip a little bit off at the time. You know, and you can see like this point here, how long it is. Well, that might go on a spear point or a specialized type error. But if they broke the tip off, well, he would put another point on it. And they would keep putting a point on it until it was to the point it was just too small to use. And you can see kind of the same thing with the other error heads up here. They had different shapes and designs. And I've got a lot of different shapes. They had smaller ones they would use for birds. You had bigger ones you used for bigger animals. You even had some, I think, that for your small birds that would actually just try to hit them and knock them out and not necessarily kill them. You know, and then they could take their time and harvest the different feathers and stuff like that they wanted from them. Uh, you can see right here is another picture. And basically, they try to get it shaped. Like I say, they're using an arrow, I mean, a, a deer antler on this one here. And then further down here, you can see they've got actually a piece of copper they're using because naturally copper's harder than the deer antler. It's still not a really hard metal, but it would work. So you tried to find what was real hard, you know, and slowly try to chip it away and get it the shape you wanted it. And my wife's telling me we got about a, a 20 second difference, but hopefully the sound is keeping up with the video. So that's the sound usually will keep up with the video. So hopefully I'm not getting too far ahead on some of this stuff with y'all. I'm trying to, to keep it as well as I can. Let me see if I can go back. I just hit something. Uh, here's another thing you can see. They would take a, a good sized core or a large chunk and they'd take a hard striking tool and just try to knock a flake off of it. And, you know, hopefully if, if they hit it about right, they'd knock the flake off about the shape that they already wanted it. So they wouldn't have to to do much to get it shaped like they wanted to. And I'm sure with a little practice, you could probably get pretty good at this, but I know too that you have different grains and stuff and the different rocks and stuff. So it may not break exactly like you want to every time. We've actually found a lot of airheads that were probably half or two thirds made and you can tell it broke on them. And the way it broke, it couldn't really be repaired. So. You know, what do you do at that point? They didn't have super glue back then or anything like that. So they threw it down and got another one and started all over again. So 
it could be a pretty labor intensive process. Okay, so that should be enough for, for seven. I don't know exactly what y'all want to put down there. Uh, you know, if you just want to put flint napping and you could put, you know, uh, breaking a large piece off and slowly shaping it to the desired shape. You know, maybe that would work. So they want us, let me get my answer sheet here a little bit further along because I'm getting away from it, but hopefully I know this stuff good enough. I don't need it, but uh, it doesn't, doesn't hurt me to have it to look at sometimes. So we're talking about pictographs. Uh, we went out to the Grand Canyon a while back. We got to see some of these firsthand. They were real interested to see. You don't really find much stuff like this over in this part of the country where we're at. Uh, for starters, we don't really have many rocks or anything like that to keep them on. And if they had carved something on a tree, it would have been long gone by now in most cases. So you very rarely find anything left here where we're at, you know, of a carving or anything. But out in these areas of the country, you will. So a pictograph is actually an image drawn or painted on a rock face. But if you look right down at the next part of the questions, it said, what are Indian petroglyphs and where can you find them? So let's see, a petroglyph is an image carved in a rock face. Petroglyphs are found worldwide and are often or not always associated with prehistoric people. So, you know, a petroglyph is carved into the rock face to where a pictograph is drawn or painted. So, you know, you could kind of class this one we just looked at earlier. Let's see if I can go back. Is a pictograph, but it's kind of carved into the rock too, so it could also be a petroglyph. So you see a lot of different things like that, but this kind of tells, you know, a little bit of what they believe the symbols are like. So I don't know if some of this stuff they really know for sure. It could be that through some of the uh, the generations that maybe they've carried this down and some of the Native American people here that are still here, you know, maybe know this for sure. A lot of times stuff like this, they just try to look at all the information they have and guess of what it is. So not anything I've studied into it really enough to be able to talk a lot. But what? But now we talk about where some of them are from, and I don't think the answer sheet really does that, but I did a little research on my own. Yeah, the answer sheet goes into some, but uh, you see the one that's on there right now come from South Utah. So if you want to see some petroglyphs, you can go to the Arches National Park in Utah. There's a Capitol Reef National Park in Utah. You can go to Death Valley National Park in California, or there's a Dinosaur National Monument in Colorado and another one in Utah. Uh, there's a Columbia Hill State Park in Washington. Let's see, there's a state park in Oregon. I'm just gonna go down to some of the states now. There's some in Minnesota, Kansas, Nova Scotia, uh, another one in California. There's one in Ohio. Utah, Mexico. Another one in Washington in Olympic National Park. Arkansas. Uh, Ontario. British Columbia. Arizona. Nevada. And Arizona. So uh, there's even more here. But they're all, well, there's North Dakota. Alberta, Canada. So there are a lot of them there. As I said before, there aren't really any of them in this part of the country. It's just not something that we normally see. So it's not something you're going to be able to see real easily here. But if you do happen to take a trip out west or even some of the areas north of us, they're neat to see. Um, unfortunately, some of them have been vandalized over the years because out where they're at, it's not like you can keep somebody there to guard them all the time, but they are something interesting to take a look at. I, I would say if you get 
somewhere like we were in the Grand Canyon. It's, it's something to go see. Okay, so hopefully we've covered that good and everybody understands what all that's all about. Okay, we're on nine on the worksheet. So it says describe uses for seashells by Indians. Well, now we're starting to get into some stuff that's a little more in the area where we're at because I'm right on the coast, just barely in Georgia coming from Florida. So there's some barrier islands here. One of them is called Cumberland Island. And you find a lot of uses where they had that they did for shells. Now, the picture that I'm showing here is what they call a wampum. And it's where you string beads together. Now, if you were a young Native American brave, this is basically kind of like an engagement ring. <laughs> From what I understand, they would use it whenever they were ready to get married. It would show that they were betrothed and they used it as part of wedding ceremonies and stuff. It could also be used in other type ceremonies that they did. So, you know, it's just, uh, I guess you could almost call it, it could also be used as formal wear. You know, if you didn't have a tuxedo back then, you use something like this because, you know, you look at that thing where it's draped across his chest there of the, all the different shells strung together, think of how much time that it took to make that. Somebody put a lot of effort into making that. And, you know, that was your best at the time. It had a lot of color and stuff. And not only did it take time to do it, but think of how long it took to find the particular shells and the different color shells and stuff like that. So a lot of work went into things like these, and they were proud of them. So that's one of the uses for shells. Um, you know, you look not necessarily around here, you get further in Florida in some of the areas and you'll start finding a lot of larger shells that they could have used for bowls. Uh, I know that I have heard of them taking like conch shells and here we didn't have rocks to make tomahawks out of. But you know what? If you take a stick and you strap a shell on it, that shell's got a lot of sharp points all over, and if you hit somebody over the head with it, it may do more damage than the rock did. So they were creative in the things they did. I know that, like here, if you take an oyster shell, don't never try to walk on an oyster shell bed, because if you slip or fall, it will cut you open as bad as any knife ever would. So they could take things like those oyster shells and use them for knives and different things like that. There's just so many different things they could use. Um, I don't know how much the Indians done it, but I know about the time they were around, they'll take the oyster shells and burn them and turn them into a powder. And they use that for a lime that they mix with a few other things. And they make a product here they call tabby and they made houses and stuff out of it. And you know they use it similar to like what we use concrete. And that was mainly, I think that actually come from Africa. It may not have been the Indians used it, but the Indians used them for all kind of stuff like that. I know here they ate a lot of the oyster shells and you'll find piles of oyster shells and they call them shell mittens. Well, what that is, is that's basically their garbage dump. So the archeologists will get there now and they'll dig through those and they'll find a lot of different trash that they put in those garbage dumps and they can learn a lot about how they use their about how they live their lives by the things they threw away you know it shows a lot of what they eat and different materials they use but like i say you it's according to what part of the country you're in they use different shells for different things but once again they took the things here that god provided and they made things out of them and they used them real well okay let's move on to number 10 says name at least 10 materials used in making Indian arts and crafts. And I think I've got some more slides here. Okay, you can look at this picture here and you can see several different things. You've got a skull there, which is bone. You know, so they're using bone and then you've got feathers. And that's two of the things that they used. Okay, charcoal. Well, you get to thinking, well, what are they gonna do with charcoal? Well, I tell you what, you can draw with charcoal. It works almost as good as a pencil. And they used it for a lot of decorations and things like that. Now, I will tell you, 
you'll get it all over your hands and all over everything else. <laughs> but you can use it for drawings and things like that. It works well for that. A gourd. This is a gourd. A gourd is like a type of a squash, but when it dries out, the outer shell gets hard and the stuff inside of it basically just dries up into about nothing. And if you want to, you can actually just leave it like that and it turns into a rattle because the seeds will stay inside of that and they'll rattle around when you shake it. But they would carve on the gourds and stuff like that. And as you can see, this gourd here would not have come from Native Americans of a long time ago because it's got cowboy boots and stuff on it. But I wanted to show you just some of the things you could do. They painted on them and all kind of things like that. Made water dippers and bowls. I've got bowls and things that we take with us that are made out of gourds when we go different places. Moss. You can use moss for a lot of different things. You know, the moss will dry. It can be used for padding. It can be used for decoration. So there's just all kind of different things you can use moss for. Turquoise. Turquoise was a rock. It's softer than like a granite or something like that. So they could carve it, but it's very pretty. You know, it's very good for decorative things and they would use them for jewelry and different things like that. So turquoise is another use. Turtle shells. You know, you don't think about a turtle shell, but you know, not only could did they actually seal up the bottom of the turtle shell and put stuff inside of it and put it on a stick and they could make a rattle out of it. But if you look at the scales on a turtle shell, you can peel those off and use those for different things because they're very pretty when they're polished up. And just all kind of different things you could use a turtle shell for. I mean, I guess if you cleaned it out good enough, it might make a good bowl, you know, for things. I don't know that I'd want to eat cereal out of it in the morning, but, you know, if you were out collecting dry corn or something like that, it'd probably work well for something like that. But just, you know, once again, a lot of native materials they would use. They could even carve on something like this turtle shell, you know, and make some neat things out of it. And they did. They were very creative in the things they did. Okay, here's animal skins that you see they've used. Uh, and you see the bead work on it. They could take shells and make beads out of them. They would take small rocks and make beads out of them. They would take seeds and make beads out of them. They were creative in what they did. They would use all kind of stuff. Okay, so that's the end of what I have there. So, and I think I even, the list that I sent out, let's see, this might have some more. Okay, I'm going to read you a few things that probably would not be something that you'd want to make a craft out of. But, uh, well, here's some things, gold and silver. You know, the turquoise we talked about. The sinew we talked about they would use. Now that was what we talked about was kind of like some of the connecting tissues in the buffalo for muscles and things like that, or like tendons or something. Well, they would actually use that to tie some of the different crafts and things like that together because they didn't have string back then. So it was a material they could use for that. They would use hooves for a lot of things. They would use stomachs and bladders and different things like that. They would even use urine and things like that because, you know, they can use different parts of the animal to get dyes and things out of. Like we talked about with the brains, they can use it to tan the leathers and things. And a lot of the stuff sounds disgusting to us today. But, you know, for them, that was like going and getting a bottle of something out of the kitchen and using it for something. It's just what it was. They had a different outlook on things and they knew how things could be used and what they were used for. So we're on to the very last thing. And this is the one thing that I won't be helping y'all with. Uh, the last requirement is to make a craft item using any of the materials named in the requirement nine. Okay, so that's talking about seashells. I do know a lot of people use a lot of the stuff that we talked about in 10 also. So I'm going to leave that up to your director. But the thing that you want to do is you want to use some of these natural materials that we've talked about and make a craft that would be similar to something like the Indians would have made. I know a lot of people just buy the little kits and they make like, like the little dream catchers. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. 
but two, it's neat to learn about the Native Americans in the area where you live. And maybe you can make a craft that would be something similar to what they had. I should have brought some of them down. I know that one of the things we made when we did it with our club a long time ago, we actually had a lady that was part of the Lakota tribe. And she had teepees and she made her own flutes and all that stuff. And she would actually go to all of the different powwows and stuff. And the thing that we made with her is we made a corn husk doll. And you take the corn, the husk off of the corn, and you can make a little doll out of it. And she said that they called them Quapachis from the tribe she was from. And what that meant is that meant little people. And they gave them to the kids as dolls because, you know, the corn husk really didn't have a whole lot of use for things they did. So they could make that for the kids. And if the kids lost them or tore them up, it really, they were not out anything. And my wife may be going to get one of them because we've got a few of them still laying around. But that's a, something very simple. <clears throat> you could go to the store and you can get some corn and eat the corn and use the husk or use the cob. But like I say, there are a lot of things in there that you could do a lot better job with. Uh, you could even do some leather work and things like that. I mean, I wouldn't be against if you wanted to work on your leather work on her to use that craft as the craft for this. So just be creative and see what you could do and try to find something, you know, that would be a good craft. It's maybe something you could keep for the rest of your life and it would help remind you of this. Um, that's pretty much it for the honor. Now your director should have the test that we gave you and you may have it now. Uh, shouldn't be anything real hard. If y'all run into any trouble, if you want to get back with me and I'll try to answer what I can. My wife's brought the little doll. I'll try to put it up here. Nothing fancy. If you got beads, you can put them on. Basically they took the corn husk and folded it over. They took some little pieces of uh, corn husk and tied around it and then they made some little arms to go through it. So that's a very simple way to do it. But there are a lot of other things that are a lot nicer. Like I say, that you could keep a lot longer, maybe be more proud of. Uh, I know my brother a while back, he wanted to do the leather work. He made a pair of moccasins and that would be something neat to have. So, you know, just think about it, be creative, get some feathers and make you a headdress. Uh, make you some errors or both, but just whatever you like to do. There's there's something somebody can make. Everybody's got different interests. So that's pretty much got our time done. And like I say, that should have something that <clears throat> hopefully everybody's learned something. We should have fulfilled all the requirements. Did we have any? Okay, sounds like we didn't have any questions. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And like I say, if you you know, would want me and my wife to come to your church or club or do anything, just let us know. We're happy to help out where we can. And if you have any questions about this honor, uh, get back with me sometime and I'll see if I can help you out with it. But I hope everybody enjoys Red Zone and God bless and have a good day. Thank you. Bye.